How's it going? Today we're going to start our live view uh, of sharpening here at Japanese Knife Imports. Uh, I'm just going to post some links really quick so that some other people can get involved here and we'll get started in just a minute. Anyways, now we should have a chance to get started here. Uh, so today, um, I just happen to have a ton of, uh, of knives that need to be sharpened, and I figured that I might as well uh, include you guys a little bit uh, in the process. So hopefully some people will join us here in a little bit. Um, one way that you can participate is by uh, logging on here and, uh, and asking questions. Uh, I will load uh, a question and answer um, feature here so that we can use it and uh, yeah anyways or actually I guess I can't load the question and answer feature but I can load the chat feature um, so if people are interested uh, you can log into our chat uh, and let me know if you have any questions and in the meantime I am going to get started sharpening here today um, so yeah that's that's the plan here we go uh, let's see what we got first One of those, and one of these. Those are the property of that guy. I hope that you guys don't mind too much, but I'll probably have some music on here in the background as I enjoy listening to music when I'm sharpening. I find that it's a very important part of the, uh, <laughs> the sharpening process. Then again, I have a blue set, uh, Bluetooth headset in, so you probably won't be able to hear that. Anyways, I'm going to move the camera over to the big wheel where I'm about to get started on uh, what looks like a Kurochi Santoku and uh, Chinese cleaver. So here we go. Actually, I'm going to move my laptop also so that I can see stuff as we go this evening. Bear with me for a minute here. All right, so let's get this camera moved. Let's see how we can get this to go. That's not the best view. Let's see how we can do here. That's a little bit better now. Cool. Anyways, like I said earlier, if you guys have any questions, uh, you should be able to uh, send them to me via the, the chat text thing here, and, uh, and we should be able to get going from there. I think this also should be live on our YouTube page. I'm going to look really quick. Yep, it is, it is indeed also live on our YouTube page. All right, here we go. So here's the first knife that we will be sharpening. 
Uh, and this one, I believe, is just, just a little bit dull. So it should be a pretty quick sharpening. And then the Chinese cleaver uh, looks like it has a bit of the heel missing. We'll see how this one goes. I'm going to be working these knives in, uh, in batches uh, just to help me keep everything organized and uh, keep everyone's knives together. So here we come over here. I believe that if all goes well, you should be able to see, not me ideally, but just the uh, sharpening setup here. Ironically, as I'm sharpening a cleaver, I'm using a cleaver to hold everything down. Um, so we're going to start with the 300 grit stone here because it's faster and easier to get stuff done. And notice that as I move towards uh, the tip, I'm bringing my arm inside a little bit uh, to be able to adjust for the tip, which is literally just lifting up a little bit and rotating back towards the spine a little bit uh, so that I can get the area from here to the tip to be in contact. The bevel width, uh, maybe I can show you up close. Ideally, maybe. So I can get the, uh, the bevel width in contact along the tip there. Now I have a lot of customers who are sharpening knives similar to this, uh, or more more rustic knives, uh, or things they've bought uh, inexpensively sometimes, um, and they're just getting started with sharpening, and so not everyone's really comfortable with stuff. And what they notice is that the bevel uh, is not consistent, and they're convinced that it's something that they're doing wrong. And chances are, if you're just getting started sharpening, it, it might actually be something that you're doing wrong. But I sharpen a lot of these knives, and uh, <laughs> I have a little bit more experience than many. And uh, what I've found is that sometimes what will what will be scaring people is actually a, a small grind issue in the knife. And it's nothing that's going to cause any trouble uh, over time, but it is something that's going to make the bevel look uh, uneven uh, and inconsistent as you go. And it's because there's a little bit of high, a little bit of low spots along uh, the bevel. So right now the goal that we have is to remove the previous scratches from the big stone uh, that we were using um, and get this ready to be able to move up in the grip progression. We're also looking to form a burr that is even and consistent. So one of the things that I'm making sure that I'm checking for is the consistency of the burr. I need to make sure that it's not bigger in one area than in another so I'm not changing the profile of the knife over time.
And uh, if anyone's wondering the stones that I'm using right now, um, there's there's a ton of stones that I have over here, uh, many, many hundreds of them. Uh, but the one that I'm currently about to start using is one that I did a little group buy for a little bit ago, uh, which is a 1,000 grit diamond stone that I've been toying with the idea of adding this to our website at some point. And uh, so far, the feedback has been good, but uh, we'll see how it goes. And once once the coursework is done, uh, everything else moves uh, a lot quicker, you know? So in the beginning, I advise people to avoid course stones as much as possible to allow them to get the angle consistency and comfort with sharpening down a little bit more. But once you feel comfortable with it, go, you know, go get a coarse stone uh, and, and get a really nice solid base uh, when you're sharpening so that you have a really easy time after you get it all set up. And using a coarse stone doesn't necessarily mean that you have to remove more steel. Uh, it just means that you can get to where you want to be a little bit more quickly. Uh, so, you know, don't do it if you're not comfortable with your sharpening, but when you are comfortable with your sharpening, uh, it definitely makes a big difference in time and uh, inconsistency. So we're going to move along to the next side over here, which I will bring the camera over to in a second. Well, that's kind of awkward with the light, huh? Sorry about that. Maybe we can fill it in with some light over here somewhere. Bear with me for a second. All right, let's see if this helps out a little bit. Hmm, how can we do this? All right. It may or may not be a little bit better. Sorry if it's not. Here we go on a 6,000 grit stone now, uh, coming from a 1,000 grit stone that we were just on a minute ago. And I believe you should be able to see the kind of uh, finish that we can get here as soon as my camera decides to focus. So quite quite mirror-like at 6,000 grit. Um, not that a mirror-finished edge really has any uh, significance other than the fact that it looks cool. Uh, what's most important is that we find the appropriate amount of bite uh, and, and edge feel for what uh, the knife is going to be used for.
right, so now that we've gone through and refined the, our, our scratch pattern, what we want to do is get rid of the burr that we formed. Uh, there are a number of ways that people can go about this. Um, I'm an advocate of doing as much as possible with the stuff in front of me, uh, which is the stone. Um, and so what I do first is I go through a stropping motion, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, and then, you know, some people choose to use cork or felt. But you can also use lateral strokes across the stone. You can use newspaper, all kinds of other things. And it just depends on how much uh, time you spend reducing uh, the size of the burr and weakening its connection to the edge before you go through this process. Uh, of, of removing the burr. So I'm going to show you the stropping part, which is about reducing the size of the burr and, uh, and weakening its connection to the edge. So here, uh, what I do is kind of like a, a J-shaped stroke, uh, starting here, uh, lift it up and rotate it back towards the spine so that the width of my bevel is in contact with the stone, and then rotating around over here. And the reason I do that is I could easily start here and push through but people have a tendency to gouge into the stone that way, uh, so this offers a little bit more flexibility. On the way back, you can either come this way and, again, make an adjustment up towards the tip, or start at the tip and come back down. Uh, it's an issue of personal preference and what feels comfortable and what you can be consistent with. Likewise, people always ask me, um, you know, how many times should you do things? And, and the real answer is that there's no set number of anything. There's no cookie cutter guideline that's going to give you consistently perfect results. What's most important is you understand what's going on here and what kind of results you should be looking for uh, and then you know work to achieve them paying attention to the kind the you know the the signals that you get the feedback that you get from your knife. So for example this knife happens to be white number two I know it's going to be a little bit easier to sharpen I don't need to spend as much time uh, weakening the burr's connection to the edge because it's going to come off a little bit more easily uh, on this particular steel uh, and especially with this particular heat, heat treatment. But on some more tenacious steels, uh, you may find that you need to spend a little bit more time uh, doing the stropping. Now when I'm ready to remove the burr, what I can do is do one of these J-strokes, which sets me up having the burr facing up here. So right now my burr is coming up around this way. And I can turn my knife over on the stone, holding it at the same angle that I was before, and grind laterally across. And what's going to happen is that because I've done a good job uh, weakening the burr's connection to the edge, uh, making it smaller, uh, I, can, I can easily remove it through that kind of process. So again, kind of like this. And always making sure that you adjust for the tip. And we can check and see, do we have a residual burr here? What's going on? We can look closely at the edge and see what it looks like and what kind of feedback that's going to give me. Did I do a good job? Do I see uh, faceted bevels? Do I see areas that don't look like they've been sharpened? Do I see a glint of light at the edge, uh, which would be indicative of me having still a wire edge or a burr? We can also test on our thumbnail uh, and you know do that light pooling motion to see, does it dig in? Uh, does it, is it sharp? Does it have the kind of edge feel that we want? Uh, some people like to use a three-finger test, and uh, and that's totally fine too. Anyways, this is this is now sharp and ready to go. Though we may strop on newspaper uh, later on before it actually goes to the customer. I guess a little bit down from there, huh? There we go. Uh, next up would be the Chinese cleaver that we have to do. Uh, again, we're going to start at a lower grit stone uh, just to make our life a little bit easier. Uh, 300 grit that I have right here will do the job just fine. Uh, but it can be any any lower grit stone. You know, there's no like uh, there's no right answer for it. There's a lot of personal preference involved, um, and so you, you got to find the stuff that works well for you. Just trying to make sure that we're actually hitting the right angle that we want to be hitting, that everything is good. I've sharpened this one before, and there are a lot of things that are kind of messed up about it, uh, parts that have been broken off uh, or parts of the edge that have, like, waviness to them a little bit uh, just from years of abuse.
slowly getting there. Again, remember this is about uh, removing previous grit scratches more than almost anything else. Bear with me for a second. I'm getting some text messages that I may need to actually respond to. <laughs> and the guy whose knife I'm sharpening right now just says he sees his knife. Uh, <laughs> anyways. Um, all right. Back to work. Consequently, to the owner of this knife, stop messing it up so much so I don't have as much work to do. <laughs> now you have other toys to play around with. All right, so we've now removed the, uh, the scratches from the previous grit stone, and the burr is even and consistent, so we're going to move on to the next side. And notice how my left hand always stays uh, as close to over the center line of the stone as possible, and it's so that my pressure is evenly exerted over the surface of the stone, not on the corners. Sorry, just had a kid recently, so I actually have to pay attention to my phone a little bit more. Again, if anyone has questions, I have the chat window open, and my computer is here near me, uh, so I can see what's going on. So you're more than welcome to to type up some questions, and uh, you know, let me know. Let me know if you're interested in getting some answers about something. Now we moved on to the thousand grit stone, and from here it's a relatively quick process. Thank you. 
And now we're on to the 6,000 grit stone. Checking up on the computer for a second. Sorry, guys. So no questions so far. No one has anything in the chat? <laughs> okay. I guess there's uh, activity on YouTube on here. So people have made comments on there. So I'm going to go and look and see what the comments look like. Bear with me for a minute. Uh, let's see how we can find this. Sorry, guys. So someone says, all right, so someone says, uh, so I'm curious if your rationale from going uh, from 1,000 to 6,000 with no intermediary stones, uh, do you do that to keep the edge toothy or what? what's going on there? Um, and my answer is that the 1,000 to 6,000 jump is not a particularly large jump. Uh, it's it's a kind of normal jump, actually. Uh, having intermediary stones is fine. Um, if your stones cut fast enough, it's not particularly necessary, and it is possible to remove all 1,000 grit scratch marks with your 6,000 grit stone. Is it entirely necessary to do that? Uh, no. Um, so, you know, part of it might be about leaving a little bit more tooth on the edge, but it's really an issue of personal preference. Uh, another thing is that the more stones that you have going on, uh, the more chance you have of not keeping your angle as consistent as you might uh, want to. Um, and so, you know, by minimizing the number of stones that I have, um, I I'm able to keep a little bit more consistent angle between my stones, uh, which is helpful for me. Uh, but really, if you want to have an intermediary stone, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, it's just not necessary uh, by any means. Uh, at all. Um, you might find that when you're doing razors or something like that, it might be a little bit different. Um, you know, but these Let's see, is the microphone back on? It seems like it is. All right, let's go back to this. So anyways, uh, the answer is it's not particularly necessary uh, to have intermediary stones. Uh, someone else asked, how do I tune the horizontal wheel? Um, and it, <laughs> it's a very complicated procedure uh, that involves uh, an ax, uh, a crayon, uh, and a lot of practice and skill and, and time learning in Japan uh, since there's no real easy way to do this. Uh, so that's, that's my quick answer there. Um, and if you have any other comments, I guess you can leave them on YouTube. Uh, but please, you know, try try and use the Google Hangout thing uh, since it's a live chat window, uh, which is kind of cool. So, anyways, uh, I will I will get back to uh, to sharpening knives now.
and, and consequently, to the to the guy who asked about the 1,000, 6,000, uh, both of the stones that I'm using in this particular case uh, happen to be uh, diamond-based stones, uh, not like a DMT plate, uh, more like a traditional stone, uh, just diamond. Um, so they're relatively fast cutting. Uh, so it's it's really even not even it's it's less necessary with these than it might be with other things. Uh, but even with our Geshen stones, I have no problem jumping from uh, 1,000 to 6,000 or 2,000 to 6,000. Um, I think the 1,000 8,000 or 2,000 8,000 jump is a little bit much. Um, so I'd, I'd probably have something in between those. Uh, but that's about it. So I'm I'm very comfortable going like 400, 2,000, 6,000 or 300. 1,000, 6,000 in the case of these stones right here. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. And again, back to that stropping motion uh, to help clean up the edge a little bit. And the burr that I create isn't isn't a massive burr. And the goal is that as you get better at sharpening, uh, you get more and more used to, to feeling for one so that you can create uh, subsequently smaller and smaller burrs as you go. Um, you know, because you don't want to be removing tons of metal each time you sharpen uh, unless the edge is uh, severely fatigued, in which case you may need to do that. Um, but, you know, that's not often the case here uh, for the knives that I'm stuck sharpening. And consequently, if, if you do decide you want to use like, you know, cork or something else like that, uh, what you would do is uh, during and after the stropping process, uh, just lightly slice through this, uh, making sure that you get all the way from heel to tip. Uh, you can use uh, balsa, soft wood, uh, hard felt blocks, uh, whatever. It's not, it's not particularly complicated. Uh, you just want to use something that's not going to damage the edge uh, as you do that. And if you haven't done a good job, uh, weakening and reducing the size of the burr first, what you're going to find is that uh, when you ch try and tear the burr off using, you know, felt or cork or something like that, you actually cause damage to the edge because you're, you're ripping a piece of metal off of it, so it ends up getting dull a little bit more quickly. So, something, something to keep in mind. Anyways, uh, we have two knives done, and I have tons more to go, so I'm going to go grab a couple more knives, and I will be back in a second. Let's see what we got next. All right, next we have a Mac Guto with dimples that has a big uh, chip in it. Um, and I've spoken with the, uh, the owner of this knife. Uh, so we're going to move over to the wheel in a second. Uh, but I've spoken with the owner of this knife, um, you know, with regard to what, what we want to do. And it turned out that this knife ended up being a little bit uh, brittle for uh, that person's taste. And so what we're going to try and do is uh, is thicken up the edge a little bit for her, which is going to be fine because it's just going to be a part of our sharpening process. Um, I see a question here uh, on the comments that is not related to the current live stream, um, but is rather a question on uh, carbon knife maintenance. Um, so the customer, or the, the person here, I guess, has a Geshen Ginga white number two Sujihiki. And the color of the carbon steel is changing, and he's been told, or she, I don't know, uh, that if they cut a lot of acidic ingredients with it, a patina will form, which will help prevent rusting. Is this true? We actually have a video on the care and maintenance and use of carbon steel knives, uh, but the gist of it is this. Um, as you use your knife, uh, patinas will form, uh, probably more so as you use acidic foods. It's just another form of oxidization, uh, like rust, uh, except it's not damaging to the blade. Um, as patinas form, your knife will become less reactive, and it can help prevent rust uh, in some way. Uh, at the same time, your knife will look a lot uh, 
more dull. It will look gray and blue and you know whatever color your patina ends up being. You definitely want to make sure that you don't have any rust on there. Now, some people like patinas and others do not. Um, it's possible to work with a carbon steel knife that does not have a patina. And again, we talk about it in the video, but it's just about learning how to work clean and organized. Uh, and as you use your knife with high, uh, highly acidic foods, uh, learning to wipe off as part of your cutting process. And so you know, you'll set up a damp towel in the lower right or left-hand corner of your board, depending on if you're right or left-handed, uh, and you'll make a couple of cuts and wipe off the sides of your knife. And if you watch the video, it will make a lot of sense. Um, but yes, patinas will help prevent rusting. Uh, and if you like that, that's great. And if not, um, you know, learn how to work with your knife in a little bit cleaner way, and you can use rust erasers and other stuff like that to keep it clean. Um, the most important thing is even if you do have a patina, it's still a carbon steel knife, so make sure that you keep it clean and dry when you're not using it. Um, and when you're cutting uh, onions, garlic, stuff like that, you still want to wipe down a little bit so it doesn't change the color, taste, or smell of your food uh, with oxidization. So I hope that answers your question there, um, and I'll keep an eye out for any other comments. Um, and yeah, we'll go from there. All right. All right, back to, I guess, sharpening, huh? All right, here we go. We're going to go back to the wheel here for a second. But first, I'm going to show you this knife um, so you can see what it looks like. Let's see if this is a good view first. I wonder if I can bring this a little bit closer in. Is that better for you guys? Hopefully. We'll see. Anyways, um, let's get a close-up of the knife here. Actually, let me turn this off first. All right. So hopefully here uh, you can see the, uh, the chip in the edge. It's a relatively large chip. The rest of the knife is in okay condition. Now, normally what I would do... Uh, with a knife like this. Actually, let me just do this this way. Can you see the knife better a little bit that way? All right. Normally, what we would do with a knife like this is as follows. Sorry. Um, we would reshape the, uh, the entire edge, um, and then we would thin the knife behind the edge to recreate a geometry that makes sense, uh, possibly creating a large secondary bevel, or, you know, if the customer wants it to look kind of similar to it did when it was new, uh, blending it all together and making it nice and thin, and then sharpening the edge. In this case, uh, we want to avoid chipping in the future, so we're going to allow the edge to thicken up a little bit, um, understanding that it's going to change the way that the knife moves through food a little bit, but we'll make it a lot more tough and durable uh, so that large chips like that don't happen again. Um, so here we go. Let's see. Hopefully this is an okay view. So the first thing that I'm going to do here is uh, reprofile the knife. So here you can see I'm going to grind the knife this way. creating the shape that, that I want the knife to be like. And let me just clean that off a little bit. Minus the fact that there's now huge chunks of metal hanging off of the edge, uh, you can see that there is no longer a chip and the knife is a little bit shortened. Uh, what we're going to do now is uh, sharpen the knife. And now the knife has a preliminary edge put on it. 
and we're going to go back to the stones uh, and clean everything up. All right. Back under the cleaver over here. Sorry, bear with me. I'm almost ready to get started on this. I'm trying to figure out a way to arrange the uh, the windows here so that I can see both the YouTube comments and uh, and the video at the same time. So here we go. I'm gonna refresh the comments again, and we'll take a look and see if there's anything new here. Uh, no new comments. All right, cool. So uh, here we go. Uh, we're going to get started sharpening again. Uh, so coming over here, uh, we're going to use the coarse stone once again. So we'll grab this one because it's easy. Wish there was a little bit different kind of view here. Maybe like that. That sounds good. Uh, one thing that you won't be able to see is my body positioning uh, so clearly here, uh, but the gist of it is this. I have one foot forward and one foot kind of back to the side, uh, so my feet are spaced kind of like this, which is almost like a fighting stance, uh, which shifts my body. Instead of facing straight forward, I'm off a little bit to the side. Uh, so instead of you seeing me stand like this, uh, what I have is when I, my foot comes back, my body gets shifted to the side, and this gives my arm better range of motion. So as I'm moving back and forth, uh, it's a lot easier. I'm not like elbowing myself in the kidneys the entire time, but I have a little bit better range of motion. Uh, so I hope that that makes sense. Again, keep in mind the, uh, the tip adjustment. Uh, lifting up and rotating back towards the spine as you come up towards the tip. And you can do this a number of different ways. You know, um, I know I shot a video on this a while back, and I'd love to have a chance to redo it if I can find some time. Um, I think people people take things a little bit too seriously uh, sometimes, and, and really a lot of things like knife sharpening are, are much more flexible, and it's much more important to understand the basic concepts than to understand exactly uh, how I'm going about it. But once you understand the concepts, you're able to think about things a little bit more effectively, and you can come up with your own ways to do things and understand whether they work or don't work. Um, so it just, just so happens that on this side, I like my bringing my arm inside method and doing this rocking motion where I lift up and rotate back towards the spine a little bit. And my fingers, uh, they're a little bit spread out in this case, and it's because I'm putting my pressure here as I lift up and rotate back and coming back here as I drop the edge back down. On the other side, I actually do a slightly different technique, which I will show you right now. Um, so here, again, we can't start off uh, in the same angle approach that we have, so we start off perpendicular and coming through transition back out into that 45 degree angle approach and as I come up towards the curve I'm going to start to make small incremental adjustments uh, as I move back and forth so back and forth tiny adjustment back and forth tiny adjustment back and forth tiny adjustment all the way lifting up and rotating back until I get all the way up to the tip and then coming back down uh, and it's exactly the same kind of adjustment that I was doing on the first side it's just that the motion is a little bit different um, you know, it's, it's not too dissimilar from, I, I don't know if anyone remembers this, but I, I very clearly remember uh, in elementary school uh, where we were doing geometry and uh, the professor drew, like, a, on a graph, a series of straight lines that came together uh, to create a curve. In fact, I might be able to draw it out for you on one of our little boards. Let's see if this works really quick. Bear with my horrible drawing skills. Uh, so let me just draw this and get a close-up view of it. So the gist of it is, wow, that looks horrible. Uh, you can't see any of that. Uh, something kind of like that, um, where it's a bunch of straight lines that come together to make a curve. Uh, we're doing a very similar kind of thing here uh, on this side, 
with small incremental adjustments, essentially. And the smaller the, the space between each adjustment, the more smooth your curve will be. Again, moving forward to a 1,000 grit stone. And to anyone that might have just tuned in, you know, feel free to, uh, to ask any questions either through the, uh, the group chat feature uh, in Google Hangouts or by leaving comments on our YouTube channel, um, which I am doing my best to monitor uh, as, as we go through this. I will refresh really quick before we, uh, we move forward. Looks like there's a new comment, so I'm going to take this uh, very, very seriously. All right. <laughs> cool. Um, thank you, Gabriel. <laughs> Anyways, if there are any other questions, uh, you know, please, please feel free to bug me. That's what I'm here for. It's kind of convenient that I had some time for this tonight, so I'm glad, I'm glad that you guys can participate in this as well. So again, the 1,000 grit stone this time is just about removing the scratches from the previous grit stone. We've already created and formed an edge. We created and formed a burr. Uh, we are looking to uh, make sure that the scratch pattern on our bevel is the way that we want it to be, that we're getting the level of refinement out of it that we want, and that we're reducing and removing the burr uh, as we go through our sharpening process. And for those of you wondering if this is the normal speed at which I sharpen, uh, generally speaking, I get through stuff a little bit more quickly, uh, but talking and trying to teach while doing this and also uh, being somewhat sleep deprived from having an 11 day old kid uh, is slowing me down a little bit. So, sorry about that. Now, uh, I just mentioned previously about how I do the, uh, the tip sharpening. Uh, and, and how I don't do it the same on both sides. You could actually uh, do the, the uh, technique that I use on the first side of the knife on the second side of the knife if you want. Uh, but what it's going to require of you is to move your body uh, to a different place. So here I can stand in front of the stone with the body positioning I talked about where my feet are kind of placed like this uh, off to the side a little bit. Uh, if I want to do that, that uh, rotational thing, I need to actually bring my body uh, off to the side of the stone a little bit over here uh, so that I can uh, follow follow through that motion. Um, I don't know, I was a line cook for long enough that, that I learned that I want to move my feet as little as possible. I'm doing things just as a function of economy of motion. So I'm not moving much when I do this stuff. I like to stay in the same place. Uh, we're going to move over to the 6,000 grit stone really quick. Hopefully the lighting isn't so bad. Really sorry. We got these spotlights in here. They're like the second sun. Okay. 
Again, back to this dropping for burr reduction and removal. And, and I'm totally not joking when I say like, you know, burr, burr removal, you can use so many different things. Um, you know, be be creative once once you get the hang of it. You don't have to be limited to uh, to cork, felt, uh, newspaper. Like I have I have a sponge right here uh, with the the non scratch blue side. And if I can see like a burr hanging off my edge, I can literally just kind of like lightly uh, scrape the edge across here and use use that to get rid of the burr if I if I need to. Um, you know, I'll go back to stropping after that to make sure that. I haven't done any real damage to the edge or anything, but uh, for tenacious burrs, uh, you know the sponge. The sponge works, uh, and and so do many other things. And again, you know, we can test and see if there's still a wire edge here, and we can test and see if the edge feels the way that we want it to do. In which case, it does. Now, uh, for those of you who tuned in a little bit late to this particular knife, it had a huge chip uh, missing from it, which you will see is now no longer there. Um, but in the process of fixing this, uh, because we, we decided uh, with the customer that we wanted this to be a, a slightly tougher, more durable blade this time, we didn't go through the thinning process that we would normally go through. So the area behind the edge, um, you know, if you look at your knife kind of in this particular way, you'll see that the area behind the edge is a little bit thicker than it might normally be. Now, it's not particularly thick by any means. I'll see if I can get a really close-up view for you. Hmm. Let's see if we can use uh, some text or something there uh, to help create the view that we need. Uh, kind of like this. I don't know if this is working at all or not. You can see it's it's thin behind the edge, but not as thin as it could be. Uh, but it, it creates a little bit tougher, more durable edge. Um, anyways, I can feel here uh, easily that this one is the way that I want it to be. So we'll move on to our next knife um, and whoever our next customer is. So bear with me as I go and find our next knives. Sorry, guys, one second as I get everything organized over here. All right, let's see what we have next. Next looks like uh, a Gishin Uraku Wagyuto and a Global Nakiri. All right, we will get through these then. And uh, I recall from this customer actually that these knives were in decent shape before coming here and he just was looking to have them uh, touched up a little bit. Uh, but let's show you what they look like. Uh, we can start here uh, with the, uh, the global. And no chipping along the edge. Right, let's move to a place that has less crappy lighting, ideally. All right, so it's got some scratches on the side, but you know the the shape of the knife is you know pretty nice. There's no chipping, nothing really wrong there. Uh, and here's the uh, the Geshe Nuraku. Again, in in pretty good shape. Um, just needs to be touched up a little bit. And for the sake of speed tonight, I'm gonna use the uh, the wheel for it, uh, just to make my life a little bit easier. Looks like we have another comment, so bear with me as I refresh our YouTube page. But we have a few more comments. Bear with me here. All right. Uh, so uh, here is what we have so far. Um, let me refresh one more time since there may be a new comment since I just did that. All right. 
Uh, so uh, we have someone here, uh, Cameron, asks if I can talk a little bit more about right-handed versus left-handed sharpening on double bevel blades. And I am happy to. Um, here is the gist of it. Uh, Japanese knives are not always ground equally on both sides of the knife. Uh, the face of the blade, I mean, not, not necessarily just the bevel. Um, and the bevel is designed uh, to, to kind of go in conjunction with that. Um, you'll find that most double bevel knives from Japan, with very few exceptions, can be adjusted for either right or left-handed sharpening, uh, which is an issue of asymmetry uh, more than anything else. Um, so, you know, you, you just got to figure out what's what's going to work well for you. Uh, the craftsmen aren't sitting there measuring 80-20 ratios and, you know, 15 and 12 degrees and one penny and three pennies. These are These are things that people use... Uh, to make these concepts a little bit easier for people to understand. Uh, but the gist of it is, as a left-handed user, uh, you may decide that you want a wider bevel on the left-hand side of your knife, uh, which will adjust the way that the knife steers as it goes through food. Um, here are things you want to pay attention to. Uh, assuming the angles are all equal, the more asymmetrical you go, uh, so away from 50-50 towards like 90-10 or something like that, uh, the more asymmetrical that you go, whether it's changing the angles or changing the amount of time that you spend on each side, the thinner your knife will be directly behind the edge. Um, as your knife gets thinner behind the edge, it becomes a little bit more brittle. Uh, so if you notice that your knife is chipping, uh, you can either make a less acute edge or move slightly less asymmetrical. You also want to pay attention to the way that your knife moves through food. If you notice that your knife is steering in a direction that you do not want it to steer, you want to create a little bit more surface area on the side that it's steering towards so that the knife uh, exerts a little bit more pressure in that direction and, and doesn't steer in that direction anymore. Um, and a lot of this will be an issue of personal preference and individual knives uh, and, and just how you like your knives to be. Um, so as you go through stuff, you know, start to start by following what's already on the knife and, and see what happens. Uh, most double bevel knives uh, will be uh, usable by both right and left handed users, assuming that the handle is, is a style that's usable. Uh, so use it first and see and see how it works. And if you decide that you want it to, to cut in a slightly different way, think about what you want. And then think about what it would take to get that, whether it's uh, going to take uh, making it more asymmetrical in one direction or the other, uh, making the edge thicker or thinner, and, and enact those things uh, using basic knowledge about sharpening. Um, so that's what I have to say about double bevel knives. Uh, but pretty much as far as the sharpening goes, you'd be doing like the mirror of what I'm doing here uh, today. Um, Bruce Harrison is asking, do I give one-on-one -on -one sharpening lessons? And the answer is yes, I do. In fact, the only lessons that I do here in the store are one-on-one -on -one classes, uh, but I'm booked up until February. But if you're interested, uh, you know, feel free to give me a call or shoot me an email uh, and, and we can try and figure out when might work. Um, and I have Casey here asking, uh, this question is about knives and sharpening equipment. Uh, I, find it, uh, I find it worth it to invest it uh, in each for quality standards. Uh, but if there were one that would be acceptable or more acceptable uh, for a price compromise, what would it be? Uh, given that I'll be using the knife very regularly and I'm diligent about maintenance, uh, a high-quality knife and okay stones, question mark, uh, a cheaper knife and great stones, thanks for your feedback, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, oh, and thanks for the congrats on the fatherhood thing. i got to introduce you guys to Kenzo one of these days. He's adorable, uh, says the father of his newborn kid. <laughs> of course he's adorable. Uh, what would I do? Um, probably I'd spend a little bit more money on the knife and get some really basic stones, even something like the king stones. Uh, and the reason that I say that is that uh, sharpening can be done with anything. It's not rocket science. You're taking a piece of metal and a stone and making something sharp, and it's about the basic concepts. And, you know, quite possibly something like a king stone will take you a little bit longer uh, as you go through stuff, may not be as fast, uh, may not give you as, as pretty results as, as what you want, um, but it, it will get you there. Uh, and when you have a nice quality knife with a good grind uh, and potentially good steel and, and the qualities that you're looking for from it, um, you know, I think that might be a little bit more important than buying ridiculous stones. That being said, I love sharpening, so I have lots of ridiculous stones because it's cool. It makes my life easier and quicker and more enjoyable. Um, but probably initially I'd spend my money uh, on getting a knife and getting then some decent sharpening equipment. Um, as, as a basic sharpening setup, consequently, you'll want a, a medium grit stone. Sorry, I'll just make it so you guys can actually look at me while I'm talking here. As a basic uh, sharpening setup, what you want is like a medium grit stone, um, something to keep it flat. 
Uh, and that can be something as, as simple as wet dry sandpaper, like 120 grit wet dry sandpaper inverted on your countertop so that the grit is facing up and you rub your stone on it. Uh, or like the diamond plates that we use for keeping our stuff flat, which is a little bit more expensive. Uh, or synthetic uh, flattening plates, like these kinds of things. Whatever it is. Uh, a stone somewhere in the you know 800 to 2000 grit range uh, and something to keep it flat. Um, in, in a more complete sharpening setup, what you want is a coarse stone. Uh, somewhere around 400 to 600 grit, a medium grit stone again around 800 to 2,000 grit, and a finishing stone somewhere between 4,000 and 8,000 grit. Um, I I like 6,000 grit for kitchen knives. I think it leaves a nice edge in the the kind of feeling that I'm looking for. Um, you also want again something to keep it flat and possibly something to hold it with, and that can be something like the uh, the setup that we have here, um, or it can be you know a damp towel off the corner of your countertop. Uh, or a, a much more simple stone holder, or all, all kinds of other things. Um, so, yeah, that's what I have to say uh, with regard to your question. All right, let's see what else we have over here, since uh, it seems that there might be another comment. And then I promise we'll get back to sharpening. Um, could you demonstrate how to sharpen uh, homogree edges on double bevel knives? Uh, yes, uh, yes, but I don't have the knife that I'm going to be doing that on right now, so let's see how sharpening goes, and I may have something later on uh, where I'll be doing that, and I'd be happy to show you. Uh, but essentially what it is is it's you make a, you know one lower angle, one slightly higher angle, uh, and then use uh, wrist motion to blend them together. Um, it's, it's pretty straightforward. And Rick, thank you very much for your comment. All right, and wow, I guess there's uh, one last comment. Uh, let's see. Oh, I see. Uh, I see that people are talking to each other here, which is cool. Hey, Rick, thank you very much for uh, for doing the patina discussion there. All right, so we're gonna get back to uh, to sharpening now. I'm going to move over to the uh, to the wheel again, so I'm going to bring the camera over with me, and uh, and we'll get these things set up really quick. Uh, how's that? That sucks. Let's try that again. That's a little bit better. All right. Uh, so first up is the uh, the global. And then the uh, the Geshinuraku. There it is. This one. Yay. All right. Here we go. So we've now uh, formed a burr quickly on these, uh, and we'll be ready to go through the uh, the sharpening process again. So, coming back over this way. And today, I think I'm, you know, because I'm using a headset, I don't think you guys can hear the music that I have in the background, which is probably good because I always get comments that some people like stuff and other people are like, wow, your musical taste sucks. 
Uh, maybe one of these days we can have like a live uh, Spotify uh, DJ thing going on while I'm doing the sharpening, and you guys can pick the music that I sharpen to or something like that. Anyways, again on the coarse stone, uh, here we go. And even on knives like this, uh, you still need to do an adjustment for the tip, lifting up and rotating back. There's a little bit of curve there, um, you know, so you, you want to follow whatever is there. Uh, let, the, let the knife guide you. It'll, you know, it'll tell you what you need to do. And part of the reason I spend a lot of time on, on knives like this, even though they're, they're not in horrible shape, uh, I'm not removing a ton of metal, but I do know that you know these knives go through serious abuse in professional environments, and the edge gets banged up and fatigued. And uh, you know the, people are using honing rods with them and all kinds of other stuff uh, that's, that's detrimental to the edge. Uh, and so we, we try and get rid of the steel that's not going to hold up anymore and expose some fresh steel without removing so much that it's... Uh, you know, severely detrimental to the, the life of the knife. Actually, I just I thought of something that might be useful for some of you guys out there, uh, which is, uh, you know, what, what angle am I sharpening at? A lot of people seem to be curious about uh, exactly uh, what angle I'm sharpening at. And I always tell people it doesn't matter, you know, uh, you keep in mind that, like, the more acute the angle is, uh, the, the more delicate your knife will be, but the easier it will move through food. The less acute it is, um, you know, the tougher and more durable it will be, but it's not going to move through food quite the same way. Uh, and a safe bet for Japanese knives might be somewhere between 10 and 15 degrees. If you're a little bit over that, it's not the end of the world. If you're a little bit less than that, it's not the end of the world. Um, but what I found is that most people have no freaking clue uh, what 10 or 15 degrees looks like. Uh, and so uh, what I found is that there's an app for that. Uh, I kid you not. Uh, you can see my phone here. This is a digital angle finder. Uh, and what it will allow you to do is this. Uh, on the surface that you'll be... Uh, sharpening on, and uh, make sure that your phone doesn't get wet as you do this. You can set, you can set your uh, your phone down, and it will look something like this, right? And uh, we can reset this and calibrate it. So now it's zeroed out. And what we can do then is, as we lift up, you can see here, ideally, that now we're at like 10 degrees, 10.5. Uh, and coming up, uh, you know, 13, 14, 15. And what does that look like? You know, where where are you here? And it will give you a better idea. So, for example, uh, here I'm about 4.5 degrees. Uh, here I'm about 8.5 degrees. This is just around 10 degrees. Uh, here is like right around 15 degrees. You know, so what does that look like? And what it, you know, how's it going to play into uh, your sharpening? Um, it can be really useful. So, you know, Google it. Look it up. Uh, there's there's all kinds of Angle Finder apps out there. Um, this just happened to be one called Angle Finder for uh, iPhone. Uh, but there are some Android ones as well. I'm sure there's some on Windows Phone. Uh, kind of cool stuff. So something to uh, to keep in mind.
All right, and before I move on to the medium grid stone, I'll check again to see uh, if there are any new comments over here and, uh, you know, see if I can answer any of your questions. Uh, bear with me. All right, let's see, newest comments first. Don't know why, but I love the way that wheel sounds. Uh, I wish you were my neighbor because uh, it sucks for them sometimes. Um, blah, blah, blah. Everything else looks pretty much the same. Cool. All right. I think we should be good to continue. Uh, let me just look at a couple other places and see uh, if anyone's left comments on Facebook or, or on any of the other places that I've posted stuff. Huh. One second, please. All right. Looks like we are good to go again. All right. So now we're back to the 1,000 grit stone here and just removing scratches from previous grit stones. And, and Charles, to answer your question uh, on the on the Hamaguri edge, uh, let me just grab a wide bevel knife from my collection really quick, and I can kind of show you uh, what it looks like. So bear with me here. Uh, how can you see? Wow, the lighting really sucks, guys. Sorry about that. Uh, Geshin Heiji is the answer here. I don't know if you can see that at all. Wow, this is horrible. I'm really sorry. There it is. All right, so you can see this is a wide bevel knife. Um, and what's going to happen on this is it is a hamagri edge. So um, as I put this down on the stones, the first thing that I'm going to be doing is this. Um, let me move this a little bit closer. So my fingers are going to be right above on the shinogi line. All right, and my pressure... Uh, is going to be, one second please, whoops, alright, and my pressure is going to be uh, down and back against the shinogi line as if I'm pushing into it a little bit, but not rocking over it, right, um, so that's going to be my first sharpening and I'll go all the way through and do that sharpening. Uh, once that's done, uh, what I'll do is put my fingers down here closer to the edge uh, so they'll be like here instead of here right and as they're closer to the edge it's not so much that I'm changing the angle I'm not gonna like lift up to a significant degree and actually change the angle but the angle will slightly change as I shift my pressure uh, so as I press down here at the edge uh, I'm gonna be pushing down and towards the edge this time and then once I have everything all set up and the two bevels are there consistently and even across the, uh, the blade, uh, what I'll do is I'll use the slight wrist rocking motion, very slight, um, to, to blend those two together uh, in, a, in a smooth, even manner. And it helps if you have a, a uh, soft, muddy stone uh, to be able to do that uh, as it's going to look a lot nicer and finish a lot smoother and more even. Uh, so bear with me. I'm going to put this away, and then I will get back to sharpening. All right. Lost track of my windows here. Okay. So back, uh, back to the sharpening.
Move over here to the uh, 6,000 grit stone. I got to do something about this light, guys. Bear with me for a second. It's driving me nuts. We're just going to reposition it quickly. Hopefully that's a little bit better as we are now aimed up towards the ceiling uh, instead of down at me. So much better. Okay. So this is a 6,000 grit stone again. All right, consequently, Bruce, I got your email. Uh, if you're still listening, uh, I'm backed up in emails. I got about 150 of them in my inbox right now, and I'm trying to get through as many as I can. Uh, but tonight I decided that uh, I was going to sharpen all these knives. So I'll be here for a while sharpening knives, and hopefully if I have a chance tomorrow, I'll be able to get the emails. Uh, so for anyone that's waiting for an email response from me, I'm very sorry. I'm doing my best to catch up. And globals tend to be a little bit more difficult for burr removal. Uh, the the metal is just a little bit more tenacious when it comes to like uh, how strongly it holds on to the the burr. And when I do this lateral motion, uh, I I still need to make sure to adjust up for the tip, uh, which is something that a lot of people seem to forget to do. Uh, when I teach them. Let's see if I can show you what this looks like here. All right. Uh, now up to the uh, Geshenaraka. Oh, I probably want to start on a... Well, actually, I can probably do this on this one. Uh, the 1,000 grit stone that I'm using is generally fast enough to, uh, to get stuff done. Uh, I was just making sure that everything got done by using the 300 grit stone first. But this should be fine. So are there any other questions that you guys have so far? Uh, if so, you know, feel free to throw them up on the uh, the group chat here on Hangouts, on Google Hangouts, or uh, post a comment on YouTube, and we'll be happy to look at it there. There's a feature here on Google Hangouts that seems to be a question and answer session. 
Uh, but it seems like it has to be set up uh, ahead of time. So we'll give that a shot next time and see how that goes. Uh, hopefully you guys find that helpful. And if you have any feedback as to how these things might be done a little bit better, uh, whether it's with technical know-how or uh, some other way, you know, let me know. Uh, I don't have all the time in the world, but I'll do my best to, to take into account uh, what you guys have to say and uh, see if I can enact uh, some changes for the better. Coming over this way now to the 6,000 grit stone. And just finishing up with the burr removal and reduction here uh, through a stroughing motion. And then we'll use some lateral strokes uh, to finish this. And like I was saying earlier, whether you decide that you want to do it this way or this way uh, or this way, or this way. It doesn't really matter. Uh, what matters is that you're consistent with what you're doing, that you hold a consistent angle, and it's the same angle that you were sharpening at, uh, you know, so that you're actually doing the work that you need to be doing. All right. These guys are done. We'll go find some new knives to sharpen. Give me a couple of seconds. I'll be right back. And again, if you guys have any questions in the meantime, I'm going to check uh, the YouTube comments in just a minute. So if there's something new in there, uh, we will see it in the next uh, little bit. Let's see what's next for sharpening. Next up, we have a lot of knives still. All right, next up, we have a couple more Gutos. Uh, here we have a, a Sakai Takayuki uh, Grand Chef and a uh, Sakai Takayuki uh, Enox 180 millimeter Guto. I'll show you in a second. Both of these are Western handled knives. And in this case, um, I want to show you something because I recommended to the customer that we thin the knife, uh, but uh, we opted to do it at a later date than right now uh, since getting them back uh, was more important. Uh, so let's see if we can set this up so that you can see uh, what I mean here. Hmm, how can I do that? There it is. Uh, I think I need to hold something up that has lettering on it near this. Let's see how this works. I think you can start to see uh, that this knife is a little bit thick behind the edge uh, and, and desperately needs uh, thinning. Um, I, there it is. Cool. All right, so that's that's one that really needs thinning. Uh, and let's see this other one, uh, which I believe also needs some thinning, um, but is not going to be thinned uh, at this exact point in time.
Uh, you can see that this one is thinner behind the edge than the last one, uh, but still at some point we'll need some thinning behind the edge uh, to really uh, optimize the performance that you're getting out of that knife. Now, how thick or thin the knives are behind the edge uh, will, of course, be a function of what the maker wanted to do, uh, and how thick or thin you can go uh, will be a function of the steel and heat treatment, along with your skill and technique in using the knife, obviously your ability to sharpen it, uh, and, and personal preference. Uh, so some people might like thinner knives that move through stuff a little bit more easily but require a little bit more care and finesse and use uh, as they might chip a little bit easier and not hold their edge quite as long, whereas other people might like something that's tougher and more durable and they can beat the crap out of it and not have to worry about. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of personal preference involved there, but obviously softer steels uh, will not be able to hold as acute of an angle as effectively as harder steels, um, and uh, also the harder steels are going to be more brittle regardless of which way you go, but obviously a lot more brittle as you go uh, into the world of uh, thinner thinness. So uh, I'm going to take a look at questions again on YouTube and let's see what else is up there. Uh, all right, so Charles says, thanks, I use the same way to sharpen homogeny edge, just wanted to see, all right, yeah, uh, it's it's pretty simple uh, stuff with the homogeny edges, uh, it's, it's pretty much just two bevels and then blend them together and soft muddy stones do uh, do a good job at that. Uh, so glad that that is working out well for you. Um, see if anyone else has anything else to say here. Bear with me. Nothing there, and let's see over here. Nothing there. All right, let's go back to uh, to sharpening then. Um, so again, here we have. The, uh, the Takayuki Grand Chef that's about to get sharpened. Um, and these are both Enox steels at about 57, 58 on the Rockwell Hardness scale. Um, possibly 59. This is the small 180. Uh, this other one uh, seems to be about 240 millimeters. So we're going to go over to the big wheel again and uh, do some stuff over there. So let's get this cord around. And... Let's see if we can do uh, something a little bit different here, where I can have you looking down potentially uh, at the uh, at the stone as I do the sharpening. Let's see how that goes. Move some stuff out here. Whoops! Tripping over cords over here. All right. Let's see if we get enough cord length here to be able to do what I want to do. Which would be to set this up. Possibly over here looking down at what we're doing. Hmm. How does that look? All right, I'm going to get some tape really quick uh, so that this does not fall uh, into, uh, into my stone. I guess this is where that gaffer's tape stuff comes in useful. Hey, that's pretty solid on there, and I think that gives you guys a pretty interesting view uh, as to the stone. Let's give this a shot.
So I don't know if you guys can see, but if you look closely at this particular knife, um, you should be able to see that uh, the guy who was sharpening this before me uh, was sharpening at a much more uh, obtuse angle than what I'm doing here. Um, and so I have to get rid of a little bit of metal. Uh, and essentially, uh, what I'm doing is thinning down a little bit, although not, not really what I would consider thinning. So here I'm also adjusting, uh, fixing for a little bit of a bird's beak tip that it occurred. Call it a day with the stone. I wonder what you guys thought of that view. Uh, I'm sure it was uh, a little bit more interesting than the uh, the last view that we had. All right. Let's see if we can get this back up here. All right, uh, I'm going to check for comments again if there were any questions, uh, and we'll see what people have to say, and then uh, and then get back to sharpening again. All right.
Uh, Spec Zero asks, can I do straight razor sharpening? Uh, yes, I am capable of doing straight razor sharpening. Uh, however, at this time, I, I am not doing it. Uh, I am doing only uh, Japanese kitchen knives uh, for sharpening. That is all that I do here uh, right now. And it's a function of the fact that we stay so busy over here uh, with just the kitchen knives uh, and, and doing different kinds of things uh, forces me to change what stones I'm using and how I have everything set up. Uh, which slows me down, and I want to get stuff back to my customers as quickly as possible. Uh, so we do only Japanese kitchen knives right now. Uh, that is that is what's going on there. All right. So back here to our stone. We'll go back to our post core stone again. And it's all pretty much the same thing over and over. Coarse, medium, fine. Uh, consistent angle. Make sure that you get rid of the uh, previous grit scratch pattern, uh, especially when it comes to the coarser things. Uh, when it comes to medium and fine grit stones, you may decide you want to leave a little bit just for tooth. Um, and then, you know, make sure you're forming a burr uh, first on one side, then uh, then forming it on the other side, and then and then removing it. And that's it. That's what you're doing in sharpening every day. Always the same. So right now I'm trying to make sure that I consistently and evenly remove the scratches uh, from the coarse wheel uh, on my coarse stone. And then I'll move up here uh, to a medium grid stone and finishing stone again. And there's just a tiny bit of scratching uh, up at the top of the bevel uh, right here, which I'm trying to get rid of. And it's because uh, my, my wheel, and, and all wheels for that matter, uh, are not always going to be perfectly even. Uh, and so you get some vertical movement as you're, as you're uh, sharpening, whether it's on the kind of wheel that I have or the kind of wheel uh, that rotates this way. Um, the, the surface isn't even, so you have to kind of play around with that a little bit, and a lot of that's fixed uh, on stones like this. And part of what I'm looking for when I turn over the blade to look is uh, is whether or not my angle has been consistent uh, through the course of uh, all of my different sharpenings uh, on different stones and from the wheel. Um, you know, where where are the scratches occurring? Did I get all the scratches out that I wanted to get? Uh, did I go low enough? Did I go high enough? Am I just right on? Uh, where am I? And so I look at these things each time I sharpen uh, to make adjustments as I go through. And it's, and it's very important to check your work. You know, um, no one's going to be consistent and perfect 100% of the time. Um, you get better with time, but uh, it doesn't mean that you can uh, slack off when it comes to making sure and verifying that you've done a good job. Uh, plus, it just helps you be a better sharpener when you check and you have uh, constant feedback, uh, whether it's tactile feedback or visual feedback or auditory feedback uh, from your sharpening. The more, the more feedback that you get, uh, the better that you can the better that you can be and the better that you can make adjustments uh, as necessary to achieve the kinds of results that you might be looking for.
And we're done with the coarse stone, so we'll move to our medium grit stone. Well, that's cool. It seems like it's automatically updating uh, my comment feed now, so uh, I don't have to adjust it all the time. Sweet. Thank you guys for watching, by the way. I do appreciate that, uh, that people find this interesting enough to tune in. And again, for anyone who's just recently tuned in, uh, you know, feel free to ask any questions that you want, whether it's through the, uh, the Google Hangouts uh, chat window uh, or through the comments in YouTube um, you know, or a comment on Facebook or something like that. Um, I'm, I'm happy to, to answer any questions that you guys might have uh, to the best of my abilities right now as I'm just trying to get through all the backlog of sharpening that I have. If you guys are interested, by the way, uh, on this one, I can show you a new stone that we're actually in the process of testing right now, uh, which I think I took some pictures of a little bit ago, uh, which we called synthetic natural, uh, and it's a, a new type of stone uh, that we've been kind of working on with one of the stone makers that we work with. Um, you know, oftentimes when I have stones made, I go through like a number of prototypes, uh, trying to hone in on exactly what I want. Uh, but usually what we do is we do stuff in a somewhat traditional manner. So like for the guys that we work with that do like resinoid-based stones, uh, we get resinoid-based stones done in a kind of traditional way. For those that do, uh, you know, uh, clay-based stones, we do clay-based kind of traditional way and ceramic stones and so on and so forth. Uh, but we tried to, to mix it up a little bit this time and see, you know, how we could push the limit. Uh, with what we were doing, and so the the synthetic natural stone, and I like I'd have air quotes if I could, uh, is not a natural stone at all. It is a synthetic stone with all synthetic materials. There's no natural powder in there or anything. Uh, but what we were trying to do is uh, kind of recreate uh, what the edge feel might be uh, from a synthetic stone um, or from a natural stone using a synthetic stone, um, and also kind of create a, a softer muddier stone, but one that wouldn't dish quite as quickly as some of the really soft stones that we have. Um, so that's kind of what's going on there. Bear with me for a second here as I check up and see what's going on. Make sure that I'm not missing any comments over here. All right, back to sharpening. All right, I believe we're ready to go to the next stone, so I'm going to come over here, and, uh, and then I'll show you that stone that I was talking about a second ago. So this is the 6,000 grit diamond stone that I've been using, and I probably will finish on uh, anyways just because. Um, so uh, this is the stone call it synthetic natural. I think you can probably see there. Maybe. There it is. Um, it's a big stone. Uh, just for relative size, uh, this is a Geshen 6000 that's maybe like a, a month old or so. Um, that is about like 90 or 80, 80 to 90 percent there. Um, so this is about double the size of that uh, when it's new. And I've used, I've used this one quite a bit uh, since it came in. And uh, we'll just flatten it right now to make sure that we're starting off in a good place. And so when you're flattening, uh, especially with the diamond flattening plates like this, uh, what you're going to do is lie your stone flat uh, in, your, in your holder or on your countertop and use long oval strokes going over the surface of the stone. And you can see uh, where 
uh, where it's being removed uh, and where it's not. So like I've, I've missed this area here and this area over here so far. Uh, they're the low spots. They're probably the parts that have had uh, the most grinding done away from them. Uh, but the rest is already flat. Uh, so it's a combination of uh, the stone not wearing too quickly and also the diamond flattening plates being uh, super ridiculously over the top fast at getting flattening done. And you saw that I just rotated my stone, and it's just to make sure that I kind of get uh, even wear so that over time my stone doesn't wear this way or this way or to the side like this and become all kind of funky looking uh, since I hate when that happens. You can always fix that, by the way. It's not the end of the world if that happens, um, but it's just, it's just a pain. All right, and once we have everything nice and flat and even like it is now, uh, we're going to round off the corners. Or the edges, I should say, as opposed to the corners. And I'm uh, just going to rinse off my diamond flattening plate here really quick to make sure that I don't have anything stuck on it. All right, so uh, this is the, uh, what, what am I calling it, synthetic natural. Is that, that's what I said, I think, uh, just so you guys will be able to see. Um, it's, a, it's kind of off-white color right now, and this is a stainless steel knife, uh, kind of just normal stainless steel that a lot of Japanese knives are made from. I'm pretty sure it's AUS-8. Um, so here we go. Uh, this is a splash-and-go stone, although it's been soaking in water. Um, and what I found is that resinoid-based stones either... Some of them can be soaked, some can't. If you're going to soak it, leave it soaking. Uh, if you're going to soak it and dry it out, chances are your stone's going to crack. If you're going to use it as a splash-and-go stone, uh, just make sure that you dry it in a cool, well-ventilated area away from direct sunlight, uh, and don't let it dry out too quickly uh, so that the outside doesn't contract around the inside uh, as the outside dries more quickly than the inside. Uh, so just things to keep in mind with splash-and-go stones. So here we go. Uh, hope that you can see uh, how it cuts. You can see that there's already quite a bit of swarf there. And it's got a kind of smooth, uh, creamy feeling to it. Let me see if I can show you guys a close-up of what this edge looks like in a second. So it's got like a kind of lightish, whitish mirror thing going on. I don't know if that's in clear or not. All right, hopefully that came through kind of clear on there. I'm going to go see if there's any more comments really quick. Bear with me. And if you have any questions, you know, please uh, feel free to, to bug us on YouTube or on Google. Uh, What's it called? Hangouts. Uh, okay, uh, so I have another question here. Uh, what diamond plate are you using to flatten? Uh, and the answer is, I use the diamond flattening plate that uh, we sell here at the store. So if you go on to uh, JapaneseKnifeImports.com and uh, and look up, uh, you know, the diamond flattening plates that we have under sharpening supplies, that's the one I'm using. I think it's sixty-five dollars. Uh, and, and that's what it is. Uh, so yeah, go ahead and check it out there. All right, let's see what's going on over here. Oh, thanks, uh, thanks Jim, for sharing publicly our, our little hangout. We appreciate that. All right, and back to uh, back to sharpening. And so, you know, what I'm looking for from this stone is uh, the right amount of refinement for kitchen knives without being uh, too fine, um, but still retaining a kind of a little bit of bite with it. Um, 
where we'll get hopefully a longer lasting edge um, and, and a kind of more natural stone feel uh, to the edge uh, and the way that it, it lasts. Uh, the look, sadly, recreating natural stone looks uh, with synthetic stones uh, is, is very difficult um, when it comes to the kind of white, hazy mistiness. You can recreate contrast all day long with synthetic stones. It's really easy. Uh, but the exact look of, of natural stones is really difficult because synthetic uh, abrasives are non-friable. They don't break down into smaller sizes, uh, whereas natural abrasives are. And also, there's no binding material in the natural stones. Uh, the binding material and the abrasive are one and the same. It's, it's what the stone is made up of, uh, which is primarily silica content, whereas synthetic stones have a binding material, in this case, a resinoid uh, base, uh, and then abrasives, uh, whether they're silicon carbide, alumina oxide, white alumina, something else. So there's all kinds of things out there. Um, so just some stuff to keep in mind. I think I actually may uh, may end up leaving this uh, this finish on these knives because uh, it is it is a great feel of uh, the edge uh, for kitchen knives. I've been testing this edge out uh, quite a bit uh, here in the store and at home uh, on my personal knives and also on the knives of uh, many of my uh, chef friends here in LA. All right, this one is done. And again, I can hopefully show you guys a close-up of what this edge looks like. You can see it's not completely mirror-like. Uh, it's got kind of like a whitish haze to it, um, but it is still uh, shiny, consistent, um, though it does look like a synthetic stone. Back over to our coarse and medium grit stones. Yeah, no, no problem on the reply for the diamond stuff. Uh, my pleasure. I'm glad to see that this thing only updates whenever it feels like it. Uh, so I'm not getting all the updates, so I apologize. Uh, if you ask a question and I don't see it right away, uh, it's because uh, YouTube is not updating the uh, the comments uh, immediately when I do stuff. So let me uh, refresh this really quick and again see if there's anything else new here. Doesn't look like we have uh, so many new comments. Uh, so I guess back to sharpening again. All right, so uh, once again, we're on the core stone. Thank you. 
And if there are any stones that you guys are interested in seeing me use, by the way, of any of the of the things that I have here, uh, you know, just let me know. I'm happy to show you what different stones look like, uh, sound like, uh, as as close to feel like as I can through a uh, YouTube video. Uh, but of course, we have all the stones we sell, the Geshen stones over here, uh, along with all kinds of other fun toys that I have sitting around, whether it's prototypes we've had made over the years, uh, old stones that I used to use a long time ago, whatever it is. Uh, we have quite a bit of stuff over here. Just looking to make sure I've done a consistent and even job as well. All right, we'll move on to our medium grid stone. And, and through the course of all of my sharpening here, uh, never once have I used uh, what I would consider to be uh, heavy heavy pressure. Um, I think the most that I'm pressing, we'll find out in a second, uh, is, let's see what the scale says. The most that I'm pressing is in grams, probably around like five to 700 grams. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not pressing much harder than that uh, with this hand. Uh, as I as I go through my sharpening. Six thousand grit. This one is the one that I want. All right, so we're back to a medium grit stone now. And again, just looking to make sure that we remove previous grit scratches, that we're getting uh, even and consistent uh, bevel, uh, and that the burr formation is even and consistent from heel to tip, telling me that I'm removing roughly the same amount of metal in each place along the blade, so that the profile of the blade is not changing, so I'm avoiding uh, bird's beak tips and uh, heels sticking out or being overground or all kinds of other uh, problems that can occur in sharpening. Now the back side. And uh, you'll notice that my fingers move kind of like uh, up the blade as I go. I crawl them as I go. Uh, some people feel uncomfortable with this, and it's totally fine if you want to like do this and then stop and then go over here and then move it and then go and move it. You know, however, however it works for you. I found that moving uh, kind of consistently and dynamically as I move up the blade uh, helps me get a little bit more consistent and uh, even uh, grind and bevel. Uh, but if you want to stop and do stuff, you know, just take it slow. Uh, don't go too crazy with it. Make sure that you're maintaining a consistent angle, and you should be good to go. You work, work at your own pace, work with uh, what feels comfortable to you, and uh, just look at, at the results that you're getting and, and pay attention to the feedback that your sharpening gives you. All right, again, moving on to a finishing stone. I'll just move this back out of the way.
you can see this is a lot muddier than the diamond stones. Uh, a lot of swarf is coming off. Um, you know, it creates a kind of nice uh, soft mud. And for uh, anyone who just tuned in, this is a new prototype stone that we're testing out, uh, what we call the uh, synthetic natural. It does not have any natural stone powders. Uh, there's nothing that is natural about it. All that we were trying to do was recreate the, uh, the edge feel, the type of edge that natural stones give. I see that we have uh, another question here. Uh, the the question seems to be: uh, Does natural is natural stone sharpening uh, better than synthetic stone sharpening? Um, and the answer is, uh, it's different. Uh, better or worse uh, is a lot an issue of personal preference. Uh, what you will find is that synthetic stones will almost always cut faster and be more consistent not only through the course of one sharpening uh, and, the, and the finish that you get, but also more consistent over time as you wear through the stone, whereas natural stones will continue to change as you wear through them, and also different spots on the surface may be different, um, you know, and they're, and they're not going to cut quite as fast, and depending on the kind of steel that you're sharpening. Uh, depending on what level of grit you're looking at, uh, so often people have a tendency to go too high with their finish on natural stones for a lot of the knives that they're sharpening, uh, you have no need to get like some crazy hard high grit stone and finish your chef's knife on it. Uh, it's just it's just not that smart. Um, what natural stones do, which is kind of nice, is that um, the grit, the particles, the abrasive particles, uh, break down as you're sharpening, and so you'll end up with a, a wide variety of abrasive grit ranges uh, through the course of one sharpening uh, all at the same time. And so you'll have different sized teeth along the edge, uh, which helps create a different kind of edge feel and sometimes can help the edge last a little bit longer. And then, of course, there's the aesthetic side of it. Uh, and some people like the way aesthetically that natural stones finish. Uh, are they better uh, or worse? It really depends. I will say, though, uh, in coarse stones and medium grit stones, uh, natural stones are not the way to go. Uh, if you do it, it's literally just because you wanted to or just for fun. Uh, when it comes to finishing stones, there can sometimes be benefits uh, depending on what you're looking for and uh, personal preference. Uh, so that is my answer to Sean9910. And to uh, EBR guy, uh, it says, looks like the core stone you're using is Mark 300. It looks very thin. Is that one of the new diamond stones? Um, it is a 300 grit stone, uh, and it is a diamond stone. Uh, and it is one that I'm testing. It is not one of the new diamond stones that I started selling. I have, I don't know, probably like 15 or 20 different uh, diamond stones of various kinds of composition and construction from many, many, many different uh, sources and makers and manufacturers. Um, and, you know, I just I like to play around with stuff and see how it works. Uh, the one that I'm using right now uh, may or may not be something that we end up going with, uh, but I am testing it right now. Um, and, of course, testing is fun. Uh, it's not as fast as I would have expected for 300 grit, but it does remove the 150 git scratches that I often have on the knives after uh, some of my sharpening uh, quite quickly, uh, and it doesn't dish very quickly at all. I've sharpened hundreds of knives on it so far, uh, and it's doing just fine. Uh, so uh, those are my answers to the newest questions that I see here on YouTube, and I will get back to uh, finishing this knife.
On, on the natural stones, you know, there's a wide variety of natural stones. Sorry, I just I want to add a couple more things. Some will be harder, some will be softer, and there's a lot of personal preference involved in that to an extent. Um, every, every stone provider, a professional knife sharpener and knife craftsman that I have ever talked to in Japan, every single one of them uh, across the board agrees that generally speaking, uh, softer natural stones are more appropriate for kitchen knives and the harder natural stones are better suited to uh, razors and woodworking tools uh, and and a large portion of the reason that they say that is this uh, softer stones release uh, grit more quickly uh, and in natural stones that means that they don't finish quite as high um, you know so you get a little bit toothier of an edge uh, from a relatively fine grit stone uh, which is what people say is good and and I agree with them you're looking for some bite on your edge going too high um, you know people people are like oh well it cuts and it digs into my food um, I think people misunderstand uh, what the appropriate edge is for kitchen knives and what bite means uh, bite doesn't mean that it just goes through your tomato and digs into stuff bite means that you're also getting some kind of tactile feedback from it uh, in, in the sense that there's a grippiness to the edge uh, that is not achieved at really high grit stones. You're not going to get that kind of grippiness at uh, 10,000 grit, 12,000 grit, 15,000 grit, sometimes not even 8,000 grit, depending on uh, your skill level and your ability to feel things. Um, you know, so, so please keep that in mind. Uh, I'm not telling you to finish on like 1,000-ish grit natural stones, but uh, you know, don't go and get some uh, absurdly expensive, really high-end, hard natural stone that is better suited to... Uh, razors and woodworking tools uh, for your kitchen knife because it's not the right stone. Uh, there are a lot of natural stones out there that are well suited to kitchen knives. One example of that uh, are the Takashima Awasero uh, that, that we sell here, uh, but that's not the only one that's out there. Um, there are a lot of other ones. And I have some medium grit natural stones like a, a Monsanto that I use, uh, and I just said a minute ago that uh, I don't recommend doing that. Uh, I use the Monsanto because it finishes somewhere in like the three to 5,000 grit range. Uh, and it's really soft and really muddy and helps set a really nice base uh, for Kasumi finishes on single bevel knives. Um, so that is why it gets used. So hopefully that helps explain a little bit more about the natural stones. Again, stropping uh, is about burr reduction and eventually burr removal um, as, as we go through this process to clean up the edge. And note that I am adjusting for the curve of the tip uh, while I'm doing the stropping motion. Um, and it's very important that you do that, that you follow the bevel consistently. Um, otherwise, a lot of the work that you would have previously done uh, becomes kind of useless. And no one wants that, right? You can test again and see, does this have the kind of edge feel that we are looking for? Seems that this one's going to need a little bit more work uh, back on our medium grit stone. So we're going to go back to our medium grit stone and do some touch up here. Uh, I just noticed that here in the tip, uh, we are not quite done uh, as to where we want to be uh, for our bevel. So we're going to we're going to fix the tip.
All right, now we're doing a little bit better with the edge, uh, and it's the way that we want it to be. Uh, has the kind of feel that we're looking for, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, we're gonna go grab some more knives, I guess, huh? And uh, Sean, uh, my pleasure. Glad that we could uh, help you out with your answer to your question there. As we go around, please, you know, feel free to uh, to bug me with questions. Um, and uh, we'll do our best to answer uh, anything that you might have there. All right, a whole other box of knives over here. Uh, let's skip that one since it's not what I would normally do. And come over to these. Yeah, we got quite a few over here, um, mostly Japanese knives. So I'm going to get these all unwrapped, and then, uh, then we'll get started on them. And uh, again, uh, there are some knives in here uh, where I've discussed with the customer uh, the prospect of thinning them, and the customer has decided not to have them thinned uh, at this time, though he may decide that he wants them to be thinned at a later date. Um, but you know, keep in mind that thinning is an important part of maintaining geometry, and it's something that should be done, uh, you know, from time to time throughout the course of your normal sharpening. And we have some videos that discuss it uh, and how it should be done, um, and and what you should be looking for uh, with regard to it. So, uh, please feel free to use our uh, our YouTube videos for that kind of stuff as well. One, two, three, four, five, six. So here we have uh, one, two, three, uh, three, four max, and uh, no, five max and a shun, it looks like. And uh, I'm going to start actually with this, uh, this fillet knife, this Mac fillet knife, because uh, it's not going to go on the big stone. It's just going to get done right over here. Um, Again, I'm going to take a break here for a second to look at any comments that there might be uh, and see if I've missed any questions that anyone has, and uh, we'll do our best to get to them. Huh. So Rick is actually using a natural stone right now as we were talking about them. Um, I have another person here who asks, do you always push the knife towards the stone or uh, working both ways? Um, and I think I understand what you're asking here, uh, which is, uh, is my pressure only on the push or on the pull? Um, as people get started in sharpening, uh, I tell them uh, I'd rather them focus on so many other things uh, that just having pressure both ways is totally fine. Uh, but to be technically uh, correct and, and perfect in your sharpening, um, your pressure will be on the edge trailing motion whether that is pushing away from you as it would be on this side or pulling towards yourself as it would be on this side. Um, and, and, that's, and that's primarily where your pressure will be uh, in the course of sharpening. Um, on, on lower grit stones, having pressure both ways is totally fine. Um, on single bevel knives, uh, you'll notice that you get a little bit more consistent results uh, with the pressure on the uh, edge trailing stroke. Um, with the exception of Uraoshi sharpening, Let's find a single bevel knife real quick so I can explain this. Uh, here is a single bevel knife that gets a lot of abuse because uh, I teach everyone on this one. Um, so here you can see this is our single bevel knife. On Uraoshi sharpening, so uh, here on the front side as we do the Hamaguri edge, my pressure will be on the pushing motion and relax on the, on the pull. Uh, on the back side, it's actually on the edge leading stroke, so you can see the edge is facing forward. On Uraoshi sharpening, my pressure is here, forward, and relax on the back. Forward, and then relax on the back. Um, so, you know, it depends on the kind of knife you're sharpening. Um, 
and until you feel much more comfortable with sharpening, I'd say just have pressure both ways. But technically speaking, it should be on the edge trailing stroke. Um, so let's see what we have here. I think that we have gotten through quite a few questions here. Um, cool. Check one more time, and then we'll get back to the uh, to the sharpening. All right, that's that. Good on that. Checking a couple other areas for comments, so bear with me as I do this. Cool. Uh, looks like we can get back to sharpening. Uh, is there aren't any other comments that I need to answer questions or anything like that? Um, so, move my laptop out of the way so it doesn't get effed up in the process here. Uh, fillet knife, we're just going to go and uh, put another edge on this. Uh, as this one's getting abused, we'll use a slightly higher angle um, than what I might normally do on other things. Uh, it's a thin knife and it's going to get a lot of contact with bones and other stuff like that. Uh, I have another stone that I want to use, so I'm going to go track that one down. And here it is. All right, so here we go. We're going to start sharpening this one. Now the handle's a little bit tricky here, uh, as it can potentially get in the way of our sharpening. Uh, so we're going to have to be uh, pretty careful with our angle of approach as we go through this. Consequently, Rick, as I'm looking at your comment here, uh, it's got to be pretty late where you are, isn't it? I guess uh, I guess those chefs' hours uh, get to you after a while, huh? Says the guy here uh, in LA, still sharpening knives at 11 p.m. at work. So I guess I can't say too much about it. On on tips like this, by the way. Uh, the adjustment is the same. It's still lifting up and rotating back. Uh, there's just a little bit more uh, lifting up and rotation that occurs uh, so that I can reach all the way around. Uh, let me see if I can move the camera a little bit differently so I can show people uh, what I mean by this. Uh, so uh, here you can see our normal sharpening angle. And what we need to do is reach the tip somehow. So as we lift up, we're slowly getting there, but you can see that the tip is still kind of not touching, and it's because we haven't rotated back. So we rotate. We lift up and rotate back. Now, just rotating back means that you're just lowering the angle, and just lifting up actually makes it a uh, less acute angle towards the tip. So it's a combination of lifting up and rotating back uh, as we follow through stuff here. Kind of looks something like that. I hope that this makes sense and comes through in the video. And uh, bear with me here as I make sure that I'm not missing any uh, text messages from uh, from my wife or anything like that. All right, we're good. Back to sharpening. And here, for example, normally what I would do is perpendicular, but uh, being perpendicular, I miss this whole section of the edge here. So I actually have to start off um, at, a, at a completely different angle approach for this area to be able to get this section of the knife. 
and I can transition then uh, back into my normal angle approach and, and adjust for the tip here as well the same way. Almost there with the edge. We're going to work a little bit longer on this. And we've done a, a decent job developing a, a consistent burr uh, evenly on both sides here. Uh, so we'll go ahead and move over to our finishing stone really quick. Uh, and again, we will take a short interlude to see if there are any uh, questions that need to be answered. So bear with me. Yes, 2 a.m., huh? Hey, get some sleep, man. <laughs> Uh, one of one of the guys watching right now is on the East Coast, uh, still sharpening knives also for his own personal use, uh, and it's 2 a.m. there. Uh, what time do you have to be at work tomorrow, man? You're gonna get you're gonna get crushed. And I and I say that knowing that I'm about to go home like around midnight and uh, and have a kid wake up at like three, five, and nine uh, at the very least. So <laughs> so I, I kind of feel your pain a little bit there. Anyways, uh, if there are any other questions as people are watching, uh, you know, please uh, feel free to leave comments on YouTube or on the Google Hangout uh, chat little thing that we got going on here. Uh, I'm happy to, to take time and answer any questions uh, that, that you guys have right now um, since I have a little bit of time to, to do stuff like this. And uh, here we go. We'll get started on, uh, on this knife's edge. I guess we'll stay with this stone since it seems to be working out pretty well for the edges that we want to be doing. And so my, my adjustment as I do this lifting up and rotating back uh, is, is a lot just in my forearm here. You don't see my wrist actually like breaking out or anything like that. Uh, it's all uh, right in this action right here. Uh, so maybe if you watch from here, you'll be able to see. So I come out here, and this is me adjusting for the tip here. I'm actually doing the tip sharpening right now. You'll notice that my wrist isn't coming out this way. I'm not doing any of this kind of stuff. Uh, my arm is, is straight forward and straight back. I look like I'm stabbing someone here. Straight forward and straight back, uh, and there's a, a slight adjustment here. And that adjustment uh, in and of itself uh, is going to take care of my lifting up and rotating back. Uh, it's just turning my forearm over the tiniest bit. I'm not doing huge adjustments here. It's a very, very small adjustment. Again, that weird angle approach that we have to do here uh, to compensate for the odd handle shape.
and again doing that stropping motion, making sure that each time that I do this, I'm adjusting uh, for the tip, lifting up and rotating back as I finish uh, on these edge trailing motions, which is what stropping is, edge trailing motion. Just cleaning up a little bit of the uh, edges of the stone, which seem to be catching the knife a tiny bit. And we can see how we've done here. We need a little bit more work here to get the kind of edge that we're looking for. And now we have the kind of edge that we're looking for. A good bite, good edge feel, uh, nice, sharp, consistent, and even. And let's go see. It looks like we have some more YouTube comments here. We'll take a look. All right. Uh, I think I'm going to call it a night with the uh, the live view uh, since I still have like uh, 15 or so knives that I got to just uh, bust through and I won't be able to talk quite as much as I do this stuff. Uh, so anyways, guys, uh, it's been a pleasure this evening. Uh, glad that some of you guys could watch, and hopefully it was a, an educational experience uh, and that you were able to get uh, something out of it, uh, you know, with regard to, uh, to some, some basic knowledge about knife sharpening, uh, see the way that we go about stuff here, uh, and hopefully have some, some questions answered as well. Uh, if I have some time again soon, I hope to do this. Um, I also really want to get the uh, online seminars that we were doing a little while back uh, started back up again since those seem to be effective for many people. Um, so uh, have a wonderful evening. Good night. Get some sleep. Uh, and if you still have questions, uh, you can always email me at john, J-O-N, at JapaneseKnifeImports.com. Um, although I'm kind of backed up with emails right now, so give me a break. Uh, <laughs> I'll get back to you as quickly as I can. Um, or you can call us here at the store, 310-399-0300. I am here every day except for Thursday uh, during the week from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. and on the weekends from noon to 5. So thanks so much for watching uh, and have a great day.